Hello and welcome to this Rural Doctors webcast. This is the second of two programs that look at a remote car accident resulting in trauma. We follow a country GP as he comes across a car accident and manages a multi-trauma patient. The first program focused on the scene of the accident. In this program, we look at management of the trauma patient once they arrive at ED. At each point, Dr. Olga Ward discusses the GP's progress with emergency physician Dr. Gary Wilkes and Deputy Medical Director at RFDS, Dr. Sally Edmonds. Well, Sally and Gary, welcome to the program. Thanks, Olga. Thanks, Olga. So our doctor's got a patient now loaded up in the ambulance and presumably is either going to follow them or travel in the ambulance with them to the emergency department and I guess either he or the, he or the ambulance officers will call ahead to the ED to let them know that they're coming. So let's have a look at what happens once they arrive at emergency. Stress. When I arrived, he was tacky. Uh, he has an open femur. Yeah. We've strapped the leg. We decompressed the chest. He had a tension pneumothorax. Suspected tension pneumothorax. We've decompressed. He's tolerating the Gadel and he's on high flow oxygen. Okay. Is someone able to take the head? And then yeah, get, sure. We need to go. We've got another two patients to collect. No worries. Okay. to head back to see if we can get the mother and daughter. All right. We'll see you guys. Thanks, thanks, thanks guys. Thanks very much. Good job. Is it going to put on some paper? Yeah, here? no, it's going to be a Hey, Chris, we need to put some monitoring on. I need to assess his airway, but yeah. could we move the bed across a little bit? I yeah. can't get to the suction. Okay. Thanks. Great. Brakes are off. On three. Two. On your call. One, two, three. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, brakes on. Brakes are on. Okay, so I'll just start assessing his airway. Yeah. All right, so let's have a look in here, man. Let's have a look in your mouth, my love. All right, so there's no secretions or anything in there. He's, I can hear air movement, so he's tolerating that Goodell's, but his airway's okay at the moment. I'll just keep him on that high flow oxygen. That going high. Both sides are moving. Mm -hmm. Tricky as well. middle end, yeah. Okay. I'll oh, just count his respiratory rate. Chris, what were those stats? 
that's uh, 91. 91%, yeah. there's respiratory rates about 30. Yeah, and no, I definitely still got reduced breath sounds on the right hand side. Okay, so do you think we need to put an intercostal catheter in that side? That would be side? great, Chris, can you grab one? Intercostal? Yep, yeah, sure. Okay. okay, so airway is okay at the moment and C spine is secure and we've done breathing and that. Yeah, let's move on to circulation. Sure. Okay, you're getting the pulse. I'll just get a blood pressure. It's quite cold. Yeah, it looks really pale, doesn't it? It's ready to. Yeah. Okay, that blood pressure is 100 on 50. Yeah, his pulse is about 120. Okay. Let's have a look for any other bleeding. We'll look at the leg. Yeah, no worries. Oh, Chris, do you want to whack a second IV in? Yeah, chest tube set up, so put an IV in. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll have a look at the leg. <clears throat> Jane, do you want to do the cutting off attraction on the Great, yeah. Okay. Got him? I got him. Yeah, I'm good. You good? Yeah. Oh, it's looking really bloody up here. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, there's lots of bleeding here. I'll get some gauze. Oh, wow. Oh, Big compound. Thank you. Let's put some pressure on there, yeah. Thank you. Looking really nice. I've got a compound femur there, lots of blood loss. Um, you want to put lots, a lot of blood out of there. Thank you. Do you want to um, put a splint on this? I do, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Oh. Chris, do you want to go and grab a splint? Yeah, sure, do yeah. Are you okay then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we've got this patient into the emergency department now. And uh, again, lots is happening. But I guess, what are your priorities? We're back on primary survey, aren't we? Well, we are. We're in primary survey, survey with a slightly bigger team as well, um, and at the same time putting on some more monitoring and uh, getting some more exposure. So, I don't know, Gary, you might want to talk through that. Well, we're a bit more comfortable now because we're in a hospital environment and we have staff we're familiar with. Principles don't change. Um, the priorities of treatment don't change. We, we have more staff now and we have more bits of kit we can use as adjuncts for that, but the principles are the same. Assess airway. If it's not all right, can we do something about it? Now, in this case, we can do more than we could at the scene. Breathing is going to need a chest tube. Yep. So we'll follow through with so that. So is that something that you, you kind of do as, like putting in a chest tube obviously takes a bit of time. Is, is that going to be still part of breathing? So still part of your primary survey or is that something that you might do in 20 minutes time? Well, it depends on how the patient's responding. So if, if the um, the tension pneumothorax has been resolved, which it appears to be mm. in this case. The sats are dropping, then but... we're going to need a chest tube. Yep. We're going to need a chest tube at some time, so do it now. However, if there's still obvious arterial bleeding and circulation need support, and there's only one of you to do it, then I would be putting in the IV and giving fluid before putting in the chest tube. And you just continually assess the situation um, on an ongoing basis and deal with the greatest threat. So in this case, if the circulation is under control for the time being, yes, I, I would put in a chest tube now. Mm. Sally? Yeah, and it, you're right, it does take some time to set up for a chest tube and to put that in, and it's still uh, something that most of our country doctors don't do regularly. So they might want to take a deep breath and think that through ready for that. Don't forget he's still got his uh, quite large cannula in the right side of the chest so if the tension pneumothorax accumulates again that can be drained yep. so that buys you a little bit of time but at mm -hmm. some stage you've got to just bite the bullet and do it Yep. and uh, as Gary said you yeah, set yeah. up and now this guy's and do it. saturations are dropping he's got this compound fracture of the femur anything else you would do in part of that primary kind of surveying scenario? Well, airway and C-spine. I think it's worth looking at the collar um, early on as well to make sure that it's well applied. 
um, putting it on at the scene mm -hmm. um, is now I find collars when you when you obviously when you're trying to to do something with an airway you need to take the collar off is it worthwhile in that emergency department setting now that you've got a little bit of control and a little bit more time taking the collar off and putting some other kind of um, stabilisation on that patient? Well, I think the teaching really is currently that the collar should stay on mm -hmm. and the collar will come off if you need to intervene. Um, and then the collar will go back on again, mm -hmm. uh, unless it's something, you know, unless it's really not fitting or getting in the way. I guess my point was really more that um, getting a collar fitting well is, uh, is tricky. Yep. And if it's been put on and then he's been moved in, it might be worth just having a quick look to make sure that that's uh, working well. I like the way that the uh, nurse at the airway went back, talked it through, mm. said, I'm going to assess his airway again, made sure she was near the oxygen as well, had a look. Oxygen suction. Ox oxygen suction, had the suction ready to go and uh, had a look. And we saw that the sats were dropping, but we knew that the airway was relatively clear. Yeah. The good communication between the team, the all, all, all three members there, and even ambulance when they were there as well, were all calling out what they were doing in synchronised fashion, sharing the information. No one's just keeping it to themselves. So although they're still going through the ABC, they're each doing individual components of it, and it's going much faster. I really liked um, in doing that. The the collars are, uh, have access, so they've yep. got a nice big hole in the front. You can get to the so you can actually chikia, feel the chikia. you can feel the carotid, and you can even do a surgical airway if need be for there. What mm -hmm. you can't do is, is open the mouth. So if you're going to intubate somebody and open the, the mouth up, you need to loosen off the collar at that stage. And in this situation, they've made the call that the patient almost certainly is going to need intubating, but not right immediately now. And that's going to depend upon the skill set of the doctor, how long RFTS are going to be to get there. Yeah. Now, if you were just intubating for transport, Sally, I might be getting a bit ahead of myself here, but if you were just intubating for transport, would you just sort of wait until the RFDS arrived and, and there was somebody there, if you were the other end person rather um, than yourself? Yeah, it, it really depends on the situation. Um, if, if, um, if the patient needs immediate intubation, then not for transport, then... Yep or do it, might need to um, be talked through it or they might be fine to go. Um, if it's intubation, if they're, if they're safe, protecting the airway sufficiently but they're going to need it for transport because of the lying flat, the length of time and the other injuries, then that's very reasonable to wait until the, there's a bigger team there. Um, and uh, it will depend though a lot on the, the skill set of the people who are there on the ground. and. Um, and on the clinical status of the patient. Yeah, keep monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. Mm. We've got our patient in ED. We've pretty much done the primary survey. We've secured their, their breathing, their airway. They've got an intercostal catheter in if they needed one immediately. Um, secondary survey, top to toe. Um, Gary, do you have a system? Um, yes, I have a system, um, <laughs> but everyone ha th th there, there are many ways of doing this. Um, so long as everything is covered, that's what we want. So the, the things to remember are head to toe and fingers and tubes in every orifice. So start from the top and just work your way down. And the best way to remember how to do a secondary survey in a, in a trauma patient like this is to be doing it on a regular basis all the rest of the time. So if you see if someone has been in a car crash and they look okay, just say to them, all right, I just want to check you thoroughly now. Now, you probably won't want to put fingers in tubes in all the orifices, <laughs> but you, you will um, be able to work down from the top of the head to the toes and press every bone, move every joint, chest, check for pulses, check for sensation if they're uh, intact, listen to the chest, feel the belly, check the pelvis. It, it's, um, whatever system works best for you, do that. It doesn't matter whether you do arms and then torso or torso then arms. Those are minor details so long as you do cover the Just whole body. as long as you've checked everything and recorded yeah. everything. 
Phil? Yeah, at some stage the patient's going to need to be log rolled as well, but you might want to wait until you've got enough people. I think there's, a, there's an order of things in for a small country hospital. You've got your primary survey and interventions. You want to be calling for um, transfer soon um, then yeah. if you haven't already called um, because the secondary survey is very important and will help to stabilise the patient. But the primary survey will normally give you enough information mm -hmm. that you need to transfer this patient in a a polytrauma yeah. like this. Um, so, and then you've got quite a time lag between, as we all know, because it's a big state, uh, in between calling for, um, calling for transport and, uh, and your team arriving. Yep. So there's time to do the secondary survey or you might go back and do it in some more detail. Um, also not forgetting about um, calling for x-ray if you've got that as well, getting your radiology in. Um, possibly getting some blood cross matched and some of those All things, the things that, that might, you do if you can do them. That yeah. you'll do if you can, yeah. But um, you know, it might take a while to get your, um, whichever radiography sort of service you have, whether it be the uh, multi skilled nurse there or um, someone on call from home. So you might want to get those things happening. Yeah. Soon Very as well. good point about the, the documentation. So there, there, there are trauma sheets to fill out. Not only are they a really neat way of recording all their information, they're a prompt. Yeah, um, I was going to say, to, you know, I run my secondary survey quite often off the trauma sheet because that reminds you, oh, I didn't check that or I didn't look in their ears or I didn't, you Absolutely. know, whatever. Absolutely, it's a great reminder of, of what to look for and then one place mm -hmm. to write it all down. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go back and just have a little look at uh, what's happening in the hospital with the doctor and the patient. We can take that uh, cannula out of his chest, Matt, and yep. um, let's do a full set of bulbs. He's had some pain relief. Legs in splints. I'll do head to toe. Okay. Just take this off. Mm, yeah, we're going to need to address that, but the bleeding's controlled. Okay. This rotor seems to have set a little bit, that's 24, and his mm -hmm. pulse is still 120, and his blood pressure is 105 on 50. Mm -hmm. That's right. Awesome. Do you want to grab the mask? Mm. Sure. Okay. Well, all of it seems alright. Jaw seems alright. A lot of blood around his head. There's a lot of blood. It's kind of hard to feel. Nothing can bog you. Nothing. No. Okay. So that's a 95. Okay, let's do the neck. And um, I'll hold his head for you. I'll Thank you. I'll come I'll around there, Chris. Blood pressure is 110 on 55. Those drills from the child. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks. Got his neck. It's hard to feel. There's no step off the form. Okay, I'm happy with that. It's just Yeah, ribs on the right. That's fine. Thanks, Rich. That's up to 95%. His respiratory rate's down a bit, so looking better, huh? Much, much better. Good. There's no obvious distension. Mm. 
Val sounds a present. Genitalia are fine. That's stable. Yep, pelvis is stable. Pulse is fine. His fingers are fine. Wrist is okay. Elbow's fine. It seems to be okay on this side of his body. Shoulder's okay. Pulses are okay. He's banged up this hand a bit. Oh. Yeah, he's got ring finger and little finger broken. He's got a major laceration on his hand too, but not bleeding. The wrist is iffy, it's probably broken. Elbow's okay. Shoulder's moving okay, but there's glass. A couple of bits of glass in the shoulder. Shane, there's a couple of bits of glass in his shoulder and two broken fingers on the right. Do you want to start dealing with that? Yeah, I can do that. Pulses are okay. The toes are fine. Ankle's fine. Not sure about the knee. We'll get an x-ray of the knee when we do the thing. Yeah, pulses are fine. Toes are fine. Ankle's okay. That knee is okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm going to check his ears. Chris, can you grab me a scope and get me a, a tenon hammer? Yeah. We'll check his ears and then we'll do his reflexes. And can you grab Jess for me because we're going to need to yeah. do a log okay, Thanks, mate. Sally. We're going to need to call the RFDS to evacuate this patient. Um, it sounded to me through the previous scenarios like they've probably already had their heads up. How early do we call you? How often do, does it matter if we call you often? And what sort of information do you really need with your handover? Okay, thanks Olga. Well, um, call early and call often. Uh, and call with whatever information you have. So there's a few times that uh, in this scenario that RFDS could or would be called. Um, at our uh, Central Coordination Centre at Jandicott, we have a St John Ambulance um, officer who's working there, liaison officer, and he or she keeps an eye on what's happening in the rural bases. So in this sort of thing, where they know that they've got an unconscious patient uh, in quite a remote setting, uh, we might already know about that. Um, then I think that the doctor uh, early on said when he was letting the hospital know that he's coming into the hospital, he said, uh, can you call the RFDS um, then? And in both those situations, it's great to have a heads up. Even if it's just there's been a, uh, there's been a, a serious car accident just outside whichever hospital, um, we're expecting them in in 20 minutes and we think we've got someone with head and chest injuries. That'll be enough information for us to start looking at what resources we have. Um, because the aircraft move quite quickly, there might be one that's already in your area. And the, the difference of 15 minutes or half an hour might mean that they can be diverted in or that they can't be diverted in and they're committed to uh, going somewhere else. But obviously, once um, someone's made a good assessment of, of what's there, 
um, of what the problem is, um, that's a good time to either make the initial call if it hasn't been already done yep. or to um, make a more detailed call. Yep. Now if we say doing this whole secondary survey thing and we suddenly realise that they've got a burn that we hadn't spotted because they had been lying on the tarmac much longer than we thought or um, you suddenly realise that they do in fact have a fractured arm that hasn't been recorded. Do you just ring up and add that to the to the call sheet, so to speak? Well, I guess it really depends whether it's going to make any difference. The more information we have, the better. Mm -hmm. um, this patient we know has quite serious head and chest trauma. The other um, injuries, um, it's important to know if it's going to make a difference to what needs to be put on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't always send a doctor nurse team. Some of the um, some of the transport about half our patients trans, uh, travel nurse only. Um, but in a, a trauma situation like this, we would have already tasked a doctor and nurse team. One of the things to know about early is whether we need to bring blood. If yep. we're coming from Jandakot, we have four units of blood there at the base that we can bring out. Um, but if we're coming from, say, Port Hedland or Derby, we might need to get blood from the hospital and uh, load that into the aircraft before we sort of set off to come and pick your patient up. Okay, so Gary, you mentioned while putting in the IV, take a cross match and, and a few sort of kind of preliminary bloods. Um, but you would just, would, Sally, would you just bring O negative? Yeah, I think it depends on where the patient is. Um, if, if they're in a hospital, so it's good to know what your hospital has. Do you yeah. have any blood at all? And do you have the facilities to cross match? Um, if you have no blood at all, then we'll bring out O negative blood. Um, if there's sometimes um, blood can be taken off for cross match, and pathology can speak to um, uh, their colleagues elsewhere, and they can get um, some more appropriate blood brought out. Mm -hmm. And get how much, seat. like if we if we were to to kind of make that call and say to the RFTS, look, you know, I'd like you to bring some blood. How crashed would you would you anticipate that your patient's blood pressure or pulse rate would need to be before we would say? Listen, Sally, I think it would be a good idea to bring some blood with you, or will you just bring it? Look, it's more about the mechanism of injury, uh, really. So if we go right back to the fact that it was a high-speed um, car accident with a person high speed, ejected... High-speed, high-impact. Yeah, ejected from the um, vehicle. If we know that, then um, we'd, you know, we'd look at bringing blood. Mm. Um, it does slow the process down, though. If you're coming, say, from Port Hedland, you have to go and get blood brought out. It does slow things down. Um, so we might not always take blood. Mm. The other thing is if you notice more injuries during the secondary survey, it may change the destination yeah. or it may change the urgency of the transfer as mm. well. So more information is good. Yeah, and I'm guessing this is a guy in his early 20s, um, I think the, the doctor said, that would mean that he would probably maintain his blood pressure and pulse until quite late. Gary? Yes, young people can defend their physiology quite uh, quite a lot. The, the decision to give blood is, is quite a complex one and it's best made in conjunction with someone who's going to be involved in their ongoing care. That's, that's another one of the many benefits of RFDS coming and picking up the patient and, and bringing the blood. The, the more you're able to give um, particular blood, the, the better. O, o negative is fantastic because it's universal donor blood. But once you start giving it, you can only give O negative from, from that point. If you have the ability to type um, blood and you have group specific blood, which only takes 10 minutes, mm -hmm. that means you can narrow it down to a particular type instead of giving O neg, which is actually quite um, short supply. Uh, so you may not be able to get it there. And full cross matching only takes um, 20, 30 minutes. So that can be done at some of the, the hospitals as well. So it's a, it's a very tricky balancing game and best done in conjunction with, with RFDS. And Sally, when we're trying to give a handover to RFDS with more information, the better, do you just get a nice organised handover off the trauma sheet or do you have a very specific order of information that you like? Yeah, um, look, right to the, the start of the getting the call, which is the initial part of the handover, um, some of the things that we need to know are um, uh, identifying things. Um, if you've got a name, that's great. If you haven't, 
that's okay as well. Um, but name approximate weight is helpful, um, particularly for planning with the flight. If somebody's certainly if they're over about 120 kilos, it's important to know. Yeah. But name approximate age, approximate weight, mechanism of injury and the known injuries, they're all quite important. And then we do work through in that initial phone call a fairly set order of um, things. The hospitals all have some RFDS paperwork yep. uh, that usually the nurses will fill out and will give some of that information. But in that initial call and for something that's quite urgent, we just need enough information to prioritise our um, flight, to put a doctor and nurse team, if that's what we need, and to bring anything particular with us uh, that might not be usually used. So that can be, that should be quite a short conversation, the initial one, should be done within about five minutes. And then, as we did, as we saw in the ambulance one, the later on callback can also be done to get some more, some information, more information and maybe give some advice. Yeah, and as I alluded to earlier, if you're sort of writing out information from your secondary survey, you note additional injuries that aren't necessarily going to have an impact on how urgently the patient should be got out, but are going to have an impact on the patient's definitive treatment, like, you know, fractures to their right hand or their clavicle or, um, you know, their big toe or their ankle or something. Um, does that just go into the documentation? No one knows what order you wrote it on the trauma sheet. So if you, if you find it later, put it in there. Just put it um, in there and, and it all goes it, with the patient. Absolutely. And the RFDS handover documentation has a nice little checklist on the front for, for the documents to be included in the, in the envelope to go with it. Just use your checklist, work your way through. Thanks, Jeff. Do you want to do this, John? Yeah, so okay, guys, we're going to be doing a log rope so we can examine his back. You guys have done this before? Yep. Yeah. All right, so um, do you want to position your hand so it's split down the bottom so it's quite heavy? I'll look after right, the tubes. Look after, yeah, his IV and he's got that intercostal catheter as well. So you keep an eye on that. All right, everyone positioned? Yeah. So we're going to do this on my count. I'm going to count one, two, three. When I say three, we're going to roll towards you guys. Okay? okay? Yep, everyone good? All right. All right. On the three. One, two, three. Oh. 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 There's no obvious injury. No steps, no gaps. Just gonna do a PR. Tone's fine. The prostate's okay, and there's no blood. Okay, let's get him back down. Okay, can you just put that shirt underneath on the face? Put all that back on. Great. All right, guys, we're going to be rolling back. And um, could you look out after all the lines and tubes again? Thank you. The arm um, as well, if you can. And the arm too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again on three, we're going to roll back. One, two, three, and here go. Right. Could you grab these? Um, Thank you. Uh, look, let's pack him up at x-ray and while you do that I'm going to go and call RFDS and just let them know where we're up to and then Chris when we get back let's put a catheter in. Okay, sure. I'll go get the oxygen.
Welcome to Trish with Vanta. Trish speaking. Hi Trish, my name's uh, Dr David Fisher. I'm calling from Walburn Creek Hospital, uh, requesting transfer for our patient uh, Blake Turner. Okay, could you tell us what's happened with Blake please? Uh, he was involved in a motor vehicle accident and he was ejected from the vehicle. Uh, he has a head injury, he has had trouble breathing, uh, he decompressed a tension pneumothorax and he has an open femur. Uh, I don't have a date of birth. He's uh, apparently 29 years old, but we don't have a date of birth. And what about a weight? It's about 90 kilos. Okay, just hold the line and I'll put you through to one of our doctors. Hi there, this is uh, Dr. Andy Hughes speaking from the RPS. Hi Andy, my name's uh, Dr. Fisher. I'm calling from Walburn Creek Hospital requesting transfer for our patient, Blake Turner. Okay, just tell me a little bit about uh, Blake and the status being in the car accident. That's right, he was in an accident. He was ejected from the vehicle, as far as I can tell. He has a head injury, uh, he had trouble breathing, and he hasn't been responsive from the moment I've, I've found him, really. Uh, he had a tension pneumothorax, which we decompressed, um, and he has an open femur. Okay, sounds like he's pretty badly injured. There. He's pretty badly smashed up, yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell me what is his vital signs are? His are 24, his saturation was 94, he's on oxygen, um, pulse was high but it's come down to 100, blood pressure is 105 over 60, and at the moment he's only responsive to pain. Okay, is he maintaining his airway? He is, he has a Goodell in place. He's tolerating a Goodell? He is okay. tolerating a Goodell, yeah. Right. and does he have some intravenous access? He has two IV access points. Okay, and has he had any fluids at the stage? Two litres. I would much rather wait until you guys are here if we can. Okay, but that's fine, uh, David. We'll be there as soon as we can. But in the meantime, you need to carry on looking after your patient, mm -hmm. get all your intubation equipment ready in case it deteriorates. Sure. Um, do you know anything else um, about uh, Blake's past medical history? No, we, we couldn't find any um, medical alert information or anything like that, but I don't know this patient at all. I have no history. Okay, look, um, we'll sort out a, an aircraft as soon as we can. Uh, we'll need to come into the hospital to uh, transfer your patient. So if you can arrange for a hospital car to come out of meters at the airport. Yeah, we'll send someone out. We'll give you an, uh, an ETA as soon as we've got one, as soon as the uh, aircraft is in the air. And if you run into any more problems or the patient deteriorates, please call us straight away and let us know. Absolutely, we'll do. Okay, thanks David. Thanks, thanks Andy, I appreciate it. As far as those other injuries go, things like hand injuries or, or fractured arms that will have an enormous impact on the long-term outcome for the patient, you need to look for them, you need to document them and deal with them as best you can as well. So there might be time once you've done the initial primary survey, secondary survey, to look at splinting and plastering and reducing fractures. Yeah. Um, and this patient, time. tetanus shot, Antibiotics. Um, what, what is the antibiotic of, of choice for, for country hospitals with limited pharmacy? Compound fractures are going to be skin organisms. So um, penicillin, penicillin um, derivatives, uh, kefetaxime, keftriaxone uh, would cover all of them. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that particularly there, um, uh, amoxicillin is a, 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 is a, a good oh, choice. Um, flu, stance, flu clocks right? will cover staph and, and strep. Um, if in doubt, ring up the, the trauma service and ask them what them antibiotic they want and they will give you um, their choice and any, any options or you can tell them what you have and they'll tell you which one to pick Trans out of their group. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's time's more, on your side with the antibiotic mm, part of it. It's yes, more important it? to, um, to be giving antibiotics and it is a specific choice and you don't have to decide right right now any time in the first couple of hours is, yeah. is fine i'm and just thinking about that you know half hour to an hour until the cavalry yeah. arrives the other time thing, to make a phone well the other thing that's very important um, that you can do while waiting transfer as well yeah. is clean up wounds um, because there's a lot of exposure often um, with gravel, this fellow might have quite a lot of um, gravel, gravel rash and, glass, yeah. and gravel and glass in there and if you think of the distances and the transport times it's not unusual for it to be three or four or six or twelve hours until this um, patient reaches the trauma centre 
And so if you can clean up wounds and um, dress things as well, that's going to make a, 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 as big a difference as the yeah. antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And when you do the, when you roll the patient, get the stuff off from behind them. It's really horrible to yeah, be 12 hours down the track and then them. take out a stick or a, mm -hmm. or a stone, a bit of gravel or even glass from uh, sticking in a person's back. It won't kill them, but it'll make life so uncomfortable. This patient's unconscious, um, but would you still cover them with some, some analgesia? People always worry about uh, analgesia. If the person's in a position where they're able to complain of pain and their hemodynamic status um, allows for it, uh, analgesia is a good thing, but it must be given intravenously and it must be given in, in small increments and titrate up. Yep. When someone's got no perfusion, giving intramuscular uh, analgesia is a very, very bad thing because when they do perfuse their muscles, they'll, they'll have a respiratory arrest. One of the reassuring things about major traumas is patients usually have no recollection of it at all. So it, in, a, in a really harsh way, if someone's screaming in pain, uh, they have an airway, they have a circulation, and they're actually physiologically okay. It's unpleasant, but that's not actually a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. So yes, think about pain relief, but it shouldn't be your highest priority. Mm -hmm. Think about that when you've dealt with the immediate life threats. I think for this patient, we've got someone who didn't flinch when he had his chest decompressed. He's tachycardic. That might be pain, but it's more likely to be hypovolemia, shock. Um, and as far as giving narcotics for somebody who is tolerating a Goodell airway, um, not high I'd probably just go to, back to mm. what Gary said, that you've got an unconscious patient who's not reacting a lot to pain. And finally, <laughs> we know that the cavalry are on the way. We're getting the patient cleaned up and stable. Um, final destination for the patient. Sally, is that something that the RFDS decides or something that, that the bed allocation people decide? Or should the doctor then be also, say, ringing the Royal Perth Trauma Unit and saying, well, guess what I've got for you? Well, they should have already done that. Um, but yeah, in Western Australia, it's, um, it's fairly straightforward in that the research shows that, um, that trauma patients, serious trauma patients do best if they're managed in a trauma centre. And that really means in Western Australia coming through to Perth to a tertiary hospital. So that's when you've got a combined head and chest injury um, from a car accident, then it's really, um, you need to be brought through to Perth for that. Or in the Kimberley, it might be up to Darwin. Mm -hmm. um, the question sometimes comes is whether someone needs to go to a smaller centre first for stabilisation. And that decision sometimes will be logistics about what can be done at the time. Um, or sometimes it will be medical. And if you are looking at going to a smaller place first, it really needs to be in conjunction with the um, uh, both the smaller centre and the trauma services. Would you say, Gary? Oh, absolutely. This is multi-system trauma, mm -hmm. and there's only one place for that person, and that's in the state trauma service. Um, they have consultants available 24-7. You can phone through to them directly. I've never known them to, to knock back a patient like this, and that way they can prepare themselves and they'll be ready for the patient's arrival. Yep. It uh, makes it easy. One call, done. OK, so this doctor then will have made a call to the RFDS and then an additional call to the trauma centre with, with the information about the same patient, yeah? Yes, if you're, if you're at the scene and you're absolutely pushed, RFDS may, may make those calls for you, but it's far better to go from clinician to clinician. Yeah. Now, this doctor obviously knows what he's doing. Um, he's been going through making very sensible decisions, has been with the patient right from the very start, if I was in the major trauma service receiving, I'd like to hear from the doctor who was there from the start, who's been involved in it all, who can tell me what they found, what they've done, and what response we've, we've had to that. I'll also want to hear from uh, the doctor from RFDS going out there as well, the same sort of information, but that's adding to it. So mm -hmm. always straight from the source, if, if possible. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. Um, RFDS, uh, 
we're very happy to certainly to give a heads up call to the trauma centre, give them what information. But then at some and an stage, ETA because you'll have that and an ETA, mm. yes, because we can work that out. Um, and that will sometimes dictate what interventions are advised as well. Um, but beyond that, uh, absolutely, the person who's there with the patient should fill in the details. Um, and then while we're du um, during transport, we'll also speak to the trauma centre and give them, to the receiving clinicians and give them an update, both about time but about what the but, status yeah. is. It, it's not a difficult referral. The, the trauma service are there for exactly this. They, they never say no to referral. They're very helpful. Um, it's not a matter of negotiating or ringing around hospitals trying to get someone to, to take the patient. It's really simple. Well, let's have a look at the final scenario as far as this country doctor is concerned in this episode, and that is the RFDS arriving to complete the team and take the patient off. Hey guys, how are you? I'm David, I'm a GP. David, uh, I'm under the RFDS doctor. I'm Fran. Hi Fran, how are you? Good, We're good, thanks. thanks. Now, tell us what we've got, David. Uh, a motor vehicle accident, he was okay. ejected from the vehicle. We've got a head injury. We've yep. got a Goodell in that he's tolerated from the start. Okay. Um, he had a right side tension pneumothorax, which yep. we decompress and we put a chest tube in. Excellent. Uh, right. Which is fine for the moment. Fantastic. Um, there's a open femur, which we've put traction on. Yep. There's traction splint on and we've dressed it. Beautiful. So you were the first person to find I him. Was, was yeah. Right, Okay, so you put a Goodell in at the time? Yes. And he's had that all the time? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. And breathing, there was a bit of trouble with the right side, but you've sorted that out, put the chest tube in? Yep. Any blood come out of that? No blood that? from the chest tube. swinging no. and bubbling. It's fine. swinging and bubbling. Excellent. Okay. And um, the femur is dealt with at the moment, and there's no other major injuries that you've found? Not that we can find. Okay, good work. Look, he's going to need to be intuitive for transfer if he's mm -hmm. been like this all the time. We can step in and help you do that. That would be great. That. Would you mind intubating? I haven't done it for No me. problem. We can do that. We'll just use you to give us a bit of a hand. No problem. Thanks very much, David. Hi, I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Andy. 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 Hi,
or email them at watec at health.wa.gov.au.